hope in the midst of the gloominess of shadows so that we would know that you are near. Help us to know that absolutely and without a doubt, though Michelle's earthly life is ended, her spirit has been set free. That in the moment of her passing, everything that was sick and hurting and wounded and broken in her was healed and that her spirit soars. Enfold us within the fellowship of all who would share our sorrow and help us to delight in the fact that Michelle is free. Fill us with the peace that can only come from you. Oh God, we seek the comfort of the knowledge of your nearness. We pray that as we hear your sacred word today, it might be as a lamp unto our weary feet and a light for our path in the days to come. Enter our hearts this hour. Grant that your word might shine brightly within us, that we might discover the fullness of all of life's new promises. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite Michelle's daughters, Sierra and Leanne, forward to begin to share about their mom. Our mom, Michelle, was colorful and brave. She was fiercely loyal and unwavering in her commitment to her family. She was private, unassuming, and clever. It always felt like she had a greater understanding of the bigger picture than the rest of us. My mom was so much more than her service and her ashes, and she was certainly so much more than her diagnosis. For the last four months, our mom was really sick. We desperately hoped that she would heal and that things would turn around. But fortunately, that was not the case. We are so grateful to all of you who checked in or stopped by and sent gifts or food. We wouldn't have made it without you, and we are so glad to know and to be loved by all of you. Losing our mom is heartbreaking, but we all know that she lived life exactly how she wanted to. She was the best mom, a great wife, a loving sister, an excellent small business owner, a former renovation aficionado, a lover of animals and the ocean, and so much more. She was so good at showing that she cared about you, tailoring her acts of love for each receiver. For me, she let me be her little helper, and I tagged along with her as she built furniture, knitted and sewed, and planted flowers. I loved spending time with her and helping her beautiful creations come to life. She truly dreamed of the best and most creative solutions for all types of different problems. Today, we celebrate her life her quiet wisdom and brilliant insights, her tenacity and her forceful will, and the pure love she offered up so freely. We are so glad that you are no longer in pain, and we will love you forever, Mama. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sierra. Nice. <laughs> Growing up, my mom used to call me her little songbird, since I was always humming or singing around the house. Without a doubt, I learned this trait from her. I vividly remember her twirling and singing around our kitchen with our giant overweight cat, Mouse, draped <laughs> over her shoulder. <laughs> All of us, Mouse included, would listen in awe as her stunning voice floated around and filled up the house. One of her favorite tunes to sing was my parents' wedding song, Annie's song by John Denver. We all think of her every time we hear it, and we hope she will too.
Michelle's brother, Christopher, to join us. Michelle comes from a family of five, with Helen as the oldest, Michael second, Michelle Rose third. She was named for her maternal grandmother, Muriel Rose, and the two cherished each other dearly. Michelle idolized Michael, and the two got along famously. Stephen and I were her little buddies and pesky younger brothers. In high school, Michelle was very sociable and worked at Newton Wellesley Hospital. She eventually met Chris Frawley, and they worked there together and built a network of friendships around them. People liked and respected her sensitivity, independence, and sensibility. She also worked at a diner, a microfiche place, and a title search company, and they loved her wherever she went. Michelle and Chris lived in a few different apartments across Newton with their two cats, Piglet and Joey, and started creating a loving environment around them. The loving environment they were building culminated when they moved to Michigan and along came Erin Rose, Kira Grace, and Breanne Arlene. As Chris and Michelle went to the library and learned how to renovate their houses by building decks and stone walkways, remodeling fireplaces and more. And they did it all so well. We visited them one Halloween and went trick-or-treating with the girls through the neighborhood. We went to a pumpkin field where the girls climbed on the track to hay rides in their princess dresses Michelle drove them to gymnastics, skating, dancing, and all their activities. And Michelle treasured her young family. Where your treasure is, they're also where your heart is. And she loved the experience of creating a family with all her heart, all her mind, all her soul, and all her strength, all of which she had in abundance. Years later, she said how she tried to enjoy every day of family, family life. To Michelle, every day was a gift. Another time we drove to Michigan with boxes of Christmas presents from Nanny. Lots of presents wrapped in bright paper with bows containing toys and new dresses that the kids loved. Their favorite gift was the cardboard box we <laughs> carried in <laughs> And all the girls sat in it, and I would pull them around the house until my tongue was wagging. <laughs> then we'd have to stop. And true to form for Michelle's girls, there wasn't any fuss. Everyone stood up, thanked me politely, got out of the box, and went about their other activities. <laughs> it made me wonder, what makes a good gift? It's not always the fanciest or most expensive thing. Sometimes it can be the simplest things, like a cardboard box. And sometimes it's not just the gift but the person who gives it in their thoughtfulness that we love so much. And sometimes we ourselves are the most important gift of all. So thank you to the Frawley family. Thank you, Chris, Aaron, Kira, and Rena, being the most precious gifts Michelle could ever ask for. Gifts she treasured so dearly, and then let her build a loving family with Chris, and that let her give all her abundant love to keep within her heart. And that was Michelle. She lived her life in love from deep within her heart with her patience, kindness, gentleness, sensitivity, poetic sensibility, no-nonsense problem-solving and clarity, with steely resolve and quiet determination, with principles and purpose and lifting others up, all done in ways that were unique to Michelle and that touched each of our lives. So as we celebrate the gift of Michelle, a treasured gift to us all, let's also remember to share our gifts and love with one another in ways that Michelle will truly love.
I used to I used to have black hair. <laughs> I hope it gets better than that. <laughs> so in our, in our childhood, Michelle Rose and I were, were black Irish twins, surrounded by imposters. <laughs> we shared a name, my mother's favorite, Michael and Michelle, and a sensibility. We stood in opposition to the three blonde kids that our parents had obviously picked up at the orphanage. <laughs> That was Michelle's theory anyway. They tried to come up with some dumb story about how our dad had been a blonde as a kid, but we could see the wedding photos. They were black haired, both our parents. Michelle and I were peas in a pod. About 25 years ago, Michelle and Chris and their little family traveled from Michigan to visit my family in New Jersey. We went into New York and into Brooklyn to have a look around. At lunchtime, we entered a deli, chaotic, a thousand items on the board. And my black Irish sister asked the man behind the counter, do you make Italian sauce? <laughs> His response was something like, hey, Toots, everything we got is Italian. <laughs> Which Michelle, unmoved, said, in Boston, the way we make an Italian sauce is, and she laid it out for him. He was charmed by her, and he made it. She was teaching an Italian guy from Brooklyn how to do it. She was someone to be admired, never dismissed, and never disregarded. She, she could be tough. Negotiation was not her style. She didn't try to make friends and influence people. She simply went with high expectations, and she willed people to do as she directed. And they were often grateful for the opportunity to, to be a better self. She wasn't fearless, but she was. She was brave. She was quiet, but persistent. Water on stone, wearing a way forward. But she was very sensitive, almost delicate. She had a great heart. She was never mean. She projected an elevated sense, and she raised the tone in whichever room she was in. I'm, I'm her big brother by 15 months, and I was always aware that she looked up to me unnecessarily, but in many ways, she looked out for me. One small instance that is always in my mind took place Christmas in 1971. I was 11. She was 10. Our, our father had died when we were young kids. And maybe that trauma is why I have a difficult relationship with my grandfather. He was a very different personality from my dad. And it always felt that he thought there was something wrong with me. And that maybe he tried to bridge an, what's an unbridgeable gap. But as a kid, I just felt that he didn't like me. Anyway, that Christmas I was 11, Grandpa gave me a gift of a macrame set. <laughs> as, as an adult, it occurs to me that Grandpa probably had no idea what this hippy dippy thing was at the time. But I understood it as a sign of distancing and disapproval, and I was upset. Rich, rich gifts can be wax poor, but Michelle, a tiny, a tiny ten-year-old, immediately turned this unhappy gift into a victory. She said, "We're going to make that project together." And before too long, my hippy-dippy Aunt Mary <laughs> got us some books on macrame and some beads and some twine, and we made macrame until McGovern lost the presidential election. <laughs> she was extraordinarily, Michelle was extraordinarily sensitive, but she was a tiger. She wasn't going to let me be belittled, not even by a grown-up. She was not afraid of grown-ups, and she quietly rescued me from an awful feeling. I grew up in a house full of criticism. Michelle never criticized me. <laughs> Sensitivity to Michelle came from a very deep place. And as I was writing down, I was trying to write down the stories, it occurred to me that a decade after that little story I told, I was in graduate school uh, doing academic work in algebraic topology studying high dimensional knot invariants and it occurred to me, holy crap, that's macrame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so I guess I should thank Grandpa. <laughs>
When we were young teenagers, my mother was reading The Five of Us, The Riot Act, over some now forgotten sin. She braided us, and this, Stephen, this is the original version. You tell them about it. You kids will do as I say. When I'm right, I'm right. When I'm wrong, I'm right. You think I'm made of money, but when I die, I'm going to spend every last cent I have and leave you kids with nothing, nothing but a buck apiece. And you can take your buck, and you can bury me in the backyard in an orange crate. And Michelle responded, if you think I'm going to blow my last buck, I'm going to I'll send you to you. You can't have me. Michelle's girls may not know this, but Michelle was a wild and rebellious teenager. And I have plenty of witnesses, but she was super cool. She was a rock star. For us old people, you can think of Joan Jett or Chrissy Hind or Cher. In junior high school, Michelle influenced my musical education by never letting me pick a radio station. <laughs> I remember the first time she made me listen to Seasons in the Sun by Perry Jacks. It's a 1973 song about a, a man whose close friend has died after a bout of leukemia. And that was Michelle. She was very tender. When she got her license, she used to steal Helen's Mustang and go joyriding with friends. And that's smart, right? Because stealing the car meant she didn't have to pay for gas. And Helen rarely complained because she knew Michelle was telling her friends, Helen's cool. And that kind of stature was worth the gas money. <laughs> she left school early, and for a time she worked at the transportation department at Newton Wellesley Hospital which was essentially the sitcom Taxi, the cast of characters and the occasional corpse forgotten in the closet over the weekend in the rush to Friday pizza. It was there that Michelle met many of her lifelong friends, among them her husband Chris. In their tiny apartment on Edinburgh Street, and I think I confused cats here, but her beloved cat Piglet used to get out and steal steaks from the neighbor's barbecues. Michelle replaced the steaks with better steaks and apologized profusely. Chris instead exhorted Piglet to go hunting for a wallet for some money. <laughs> uh, one time Chris was charged with transporting an amputated leg from the OR down to the morgue, and this later gave him nightmares. It was Christmas time, and Michelle had lovingly, secretly sewn Chris an oversized stocking. She decorated, filled it with treats, and placed it in front of the tree. Waking up Chris's morning, Michelle beaming presented the gift. Merry Christmas, Shank, do you like it? But Chris responded, oh my God, is that the leg? <laughs> Later, as 20-somethings, when she was around her gang of friends, which was a racy group of uh, active nightlife participants, she would talk me up to these people, and they always treated me with undeserved great deference. Her cool friends never treated me like the nerd from the library. And I would think, Michelle, this is all you, you're projecting onto me. I was riding on someone else's stamp and I always appreciated that. In her teens and 20s, she had an interest in becoming a writer. She was a great observer and I don't at all mean to convey that she was timid and withdrawn. She was, as they say, as brave as the little dog that never noticed that anything was bigger than he is. She would compose poems and send them to me at, to, at school on cards she had also illustrated. I'm not a writer, but I would send her passages I liked from writers I admired, and she and I would discuss these on the phone. She particularly liked Steinbeck, his tales of people struggling to find dignity in hardship. One of the many jobs she had was waitressing at Mickey's Diner in West Newton, and of course they all loved her there, they always did. When she left Mickey's to go on to other work, she gave them a poem she could pose about her time there particularly praising the cook, a put-upon but hard-working short guy she had affectionately called Little Half-Pint Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle's poem made Nick cry. Mickey framed that poem, and he put it in private place in the restaurant for all to read. He once said, I've had a lot of people say a lot of things to me when they quit, but Michelle is the only one who ever wrote me a poem. <laughs> A bit later, Michelle put on a blue dress, her favorite color that Mary Ellen had made for her, and she married Chris, and they wandered a bit until they settled in Michigan, and they started a family. 
three beautiful girls whom she adored. Michelle ran that household like the Von Trapp family. <laughs> Chris sometimes called her Sarge, but with admiration and obedience. But that doesn't quite explain it, because Michelle valued personal conviction and freedom. So her refrain to those polite little girls from an early age was always, make good choices. You were just little kids. For Michelle, that meant, while well, she was pregnant with her firstborn, Erin, she, over some upset, she quit her obstetrician just two weeks before delivery. <laughs> you girls share a lot of Michelle's personality. You appear calm on the surface, but you run deep. <laughs> For Michelle, the hardest part of being a disciplinarian was that she enjoyed her girls so much they really could do no wrong. She told many stories about you girls with a delighted twinkle in her eyes. She'd try to keep a brave face, but then she would tell us something. You know, she would crack up. So when Michelle was pregnant with Kira, Erin misbehaved and Michelle corrected her. Erin stamped her feet, so Michelle sent her to room to sit on her bed and think. Erin pouted and stormed out. Sometime later, Michelle went in and gently asked Erin, now that you've thought about it, Erin, what do you think? Erin replied, I think you're a pain in the neck. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle was always teaching the girls, and, and uh, uh, one time she, uh, in one of her many good works, she, she uh, assembled toys to take for the toys for tots at church, and she brought the kids, the, th the three girls, to the church to bring the toys, and she said to them, now why do we give the toys for tots? It's to help less fortunate kids. And Kira piped up, I'd do it for the candy. <laughs> <laughs> and Michelle was tickled when Kira was determined to sign up for after school classes to become a pirate. <laughs> she reported that Kira refused to believe that there was no such program. And once went en route to Brienne's kindergarten for a class performance, Kira was fussing. And Michelle admonished her, Look, Kira, it's not about you. And Brienne, little bug, piped up from the back of the minivan. It's about me. <laughs> <laughs> and during that performance, the teacher played the piano, and whenever the song mentioned the color, the kids wearing that color were the stand-up. So, of course, Brianne's strategy was to wear a multicolored bracelet. <laughs> and she stood up again and again. <laughs> Michelle really loved how clever these girls are. It was hilarious that Michelle would say to the girls when they were little, we would laugh at this. If you don't behave, no trip to the library. <laughs> uh, she has those kids trained. Uh, as I've always said, I always felt that I had some stature in Michelle's eyes that I didn't deserve. Because I admired Michelle, her tenacity and her discipline and her great heart. She could have loved a pet scorpion. <laughs> to be with Michelle, though, was to watch her watching you. She was low-key, but often a trenchant commentator. I looked up to her, and I was terrified to disappoint her. Chris, I don't know that you ever disappointed her. You helped her to build a wonderful life, a loving family, a, a home that was a haven for a menagerie of wounded and elderly animals. <laughs> she took immense pleasure in your presence, in your companionship, and in your wit. Chris, I don't know if I've heard you say a thousand words since we've met, but it's only been 40 years. <laughs> but every word has been hilarious. And Michelle loved that. When you would speak, she would look at me with pride, as if to say, see what I find? Isn't he something? And you are. She hit the jackpot. The two of you are unstoppable. Let's renovate a house. We don't know anything. So we'll watch two episodes of this old house and get the book out of the library. And now we're building, we're rewiring, let's do some plumbing. It was crazy. But she loved working al alongside you at the print shop. She took great pride in you, and you gave her a lattice on which to climb. She enjoyed you, and it was a joy to see her pride and pleasure in you. Finally, I, I can't describe what I felt when I saw Michelle so weak and frail in the hospital. But to Michelle, those are just facts. 
and she refused to let the tone in the room be anything but hopeful. Chris, Erin, Kira, and Brianne, Michelle loved your little family. You were her treasure, and she took delight in your intelligence and your eloquence. The last time I saw her alive, she was propped up amongst you all in evident pain, but delighted just to watch you chat amongst yourselves. And so thanks to your efforts, she died as she had lived, on her own terms, in her own home. She didn't want to leave us, but she was in great distress. And as always, she was thinking of others. She didn't like her girls putting their lives on hold to nurse her. She hated that. She didn't want the rest of us to see her, to feel her pain. She wanted to spare everyone else. So Michelle got small and quiet at the end. <laughs> she died in her sleep, watched over by the people whom she loved most deeply. And we all miss her. channeling all of my mom's strength to stand up here and to share this with you. When I was in high school, my mom spent entire weekends driving me back and forth to figure skate, from Southern Connecticut to Massachusetts to New York. Often, she was one of the only people sitting in the stands watching us skate to the same goddamn song over and over and over. And every weekend, she assured me there was nowhere else she'd rather be. When I took over the day-to-day -day caregiving for my mom four months ago, I realized how quickly our dynamic had flipped on its head. It was all I could think about as I drove her 45 minutes to the hospital and 45 minutes back. Her in the passenger seat, staring out the window, no longer able to drive. It reminded me of this poem by Ada Limon that I've returned to several times over the last few months. This is the raincoat. The raincoat. When the doctor suggested surgery and a brace for all my youngest years, my parents scrambled to take me to massage therapy, deep tissue work, osteopathy, and soon my crooked spine unspooled a bit. I could breathe again and move more in a body unclouded by pain. My mom would tell me to sing songs to her the whole 45 minute drive to Middle Two Rock Road and 45 minutes back from physical therapy. She'd say, even my voice sounded unfettered by my spine afterward. So I sang and sang because I thought she liked it. I never asked her what she gave up to drive me or how her day was before this chore today. At her age, I was driving myself home from yet another spine appointment, singing along to some maudlin but solid song on the radio, and I saw a mom take her raincoat off 
and give it to her young daughter when a storm took over the afternoon. My God, I thought, my whole life I've been under her raincoat, thinking it was somehow a thermal that I never got wet. My relationship with my mother was complex, and I worry I underestimated her too often. But in so many ways, she was the love of my life. She was a force. She was so goddamn stubborn. <laughs> she was quirky and a little off the beaten path and handy. She loved the ocean. She had a wicked sweet tooth. And she was always surrounded by one dog or four. <laughs> and my God, she was beautiful. She had these long, dark eyelashes even without mascara and these blue, blue <coughs> eyes that saw me. My mom was the best listener. She listened with her whole being and every ounce of advice she offered was wise. The relational skills she modeled, the amount of times she coached me and pushed my thinking and asked me to have grace for the people in my life. That's why my support system is so strong. And that's why I know I'm going to get through this. <coughs> and my mom was funny. She had this sort of wry humor that genuinely made me laugh out loud. Oh, anytime either of us did something questionable, we just kind of point to our brains and say, genetics. Together, we were like dumb and dumber. <laughs> I had to bring her to the emergency room and stuck an open container of yogurt in my bag. It went everywhere, shockingly enough. She laughed and laughed and asked me what the hell I was doing. I had no answer except genetics. <laughs> oh, the loss of our mother and my dad's partner in crime is staggering. The amount of hope we had that my mom would heal feels cruel. She was slipping through our fingers and we desperately wanted to hold on. I'm going to leave you all with the wisdom of the incomparable Mary Oliver. She writes, to live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Oh, in so many ways, I'm letting you go, Mom. But I know the love you had for me, for Kira, for Brienne, for my dad, and for so many people in this room was and is eternal. I question a lot of things in this life, but I don't question that for one minute. I love you, Mom. I'm so glad you chose to be mine, and I'll be missing you forever. I offer you now the words of comfort from the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
Indeed, we are blessed that we have a creator who loves us, a redeemer who saves us, and a sustainer who walks with us, even through the valley of the shadow of death. It is the Lord of hosts that is with us today. He is the same God that was with Jacob at Bethel when he awoke from his dream and proclaimed, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He is the same God that spoke to Abraham and to David and to Moses and to every single one of us who has had ears to hear since the beginning of time. Be still and know that I am God, he whispers to us in the stillness. He speaks to us words of comfort and hope and promise. God truly can be for each and all of us a refuge from the cares of this life when they threaten to overwhelm us. The cares of the world are heavy right now for you. And when grief looms large like a shadow as it does, I want to encourage you to find shelter and strength in the promises of God, in his loving presence, for it is in God's strength and love that your mom found strength and love also. As we gather today, we do so in the knowledge and in the confidence that there is nothing about our lives that escapes God's notice and nothing, nothing, even illness, even death, that is not within God's power to bless. God was with Michelle from the moment she was conceived it was God who breathed life into her at her birth. God walked with her, lived in her heart every step of the way, every day of her life, guiding and directing every single choice she made, every decision that molded her into the person that she would become, the person who blessed each and every one of your lives in unique and varied ways. I have absolute faith that she was received into God's loving presence at the moment of her passion. Because God is faithful to all God's promises and loving toward all God has made, I trust that Michelle is safe and in God's arms today. And as we gather in this place to remember Michelle's life, to celebrate that life, to give thanks for the great love that she knew, that she enjoyed, that she celebrated in each and all of you. We seek God's comfort, God's unending presence. And the words of Jesus come to mind from the Gospel of John. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my house there are many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I have gone before you to prepare a place for you? And I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you will be also. He concluded those words, saying, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I don't give to you as the world gives, but peace I leave with you. And he assured us, Holy Spirit, a comforter, a counselor, a guide for our lives, to walk with us, to be present with us. And I, I am sure that your mom will make her presence, her spirit, powerful and known to you in the years to come. Her spirit is all around you. Her physical body is all around find ourselves now in the stillness of this place as we remember Michelle's rich and full life, as you're still adjusting to the reality of her passing. And the last six days have probably seemed surreal. So much has had to be done that you're still dealing with the practicalities of your loss. Yet there is still a deeper reality that meets us in this place, and it is not lost that Michelle went on to glory on a beautiful Easter day. Perhaps it is 
at the moment of the passing of someone we love that we come closest to glimpsing the importance and the meaning of the hope of the resurrection unto eternal life and the significance of the empty tomb three days after Jesus' death. Because the tomb was empty on that first Easter morning, we can be assured that death itself has been covered. It does not have the last word. God will be victorious over cancer, over even death itself, over everything that would threaten God's victory over, over anything that would diminish the glory of God's coming reign. And as surely as God came to us in the figure of a tiny child in a manger at Christmas, as soon as he would live on this earth experiencing all of the joys and the sorrows that we experience, as surely as Jesus came and met Mary outside of that empty tomb and appeared to his disciples later that night as they huddled, afraid, and grieving in an upper room, he appears to us. When Jesus met with his disciples after the resurrection, he said to them, So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. And you will rejoice, and no one will be able to take your joy from you. The great miracle of Easter, and indeed the great miracle of God's love, comforts us and reminds us in moments like this that death is not the end, but yet another great beginning. The empty tomb at Easter and the angels saying, go and tell, assure us that Jesus has gone on to prepare a place for us and that he will come again and we will see him. The resurrection appearances to the disciples in the 40 days after he first appeared outside that empty tomb assure us that death has been conquered and that Michelle and all who believe and profess a faith in Christ will be received into eternal life, assured of all of God's promises, his tender mercies, his unending grace for all of the days to and we claim those promises, not just for Michelle today, but for ourselves. For every time we gather to mourn a passing, to celebrate a life, we can be reminded of the promises of a loving God. A loving God who longs for us to draw near to him when we die. To draw, draw near to his love, to his strength, to get through the difficult days. With confidence, we can entrust Michelle to God's unfailing love and overflowing goodness. And we can look to the final day when the scriptures promise that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There won't be any more death, no mourning, no crying, no pain, for the old will have passed away. I'm incredibly thankful for Michelle and I never met her, but I'm thankful for all that she brought to this world. And I look forward to the generations that will spring forth from you. I'm thankful that God watched over Michelle in each and all of the days of her earthly life. I'm thankful that for Michelle, all sickness and sorrow passed. And that she has been set free and is at peace now. I believe everything that was broken and hurting in her just was healed at the moment of her passing. And that you don't I'm thankful that your extended family and all of your friends will continue to pray for you today, will surround you with love and stories and laughter and warmth. I'm thankful that soon the days will come where stories will bring a smile to your lips before tears flow from your eyes. And as we now give Michelle over to the arms of the one who gave her to us, we do so with a sense of to the one who gave her to us and to the life that she lived. We celebrate her life, even as we mourn for death, assured of God's gracious presence in all of us. So now, dear God, we pray that you will lift up your own precious child, Michelle, 
rose tall to a light fulfilled beyond all our imagining. We give you but your own. Enfold her in your everlasting arms. Hold her deeply in your everlasting love. May she rest in peace. May perpetual light shine upon her. Would you pray with me? <coughs> o great life-giving spirit, whose commanding voice I hear in the winds and whose warm breath gives life to all the world, hear us as we pray. We open our hearts to you just as we are. We celebrate your gift of life freely given, even as we are so deeply grieved by a sense of loss in the face of death, the one of, we love so much. And the love which binds us to one another leaves us aching as those physical ties are broken. Accept our tears as emblems of devotion and transform them, we pray, into the waters of life that will nourish us in the days to come. Strengthen us through the gift of your spirit to face the future with confidence that you walk with us. Grant that the changes of life might leave us stronger as we journey. Reassured of your abiding presence, help us to knit more firmly the ties that bind us today one to another. Renewed by your love, help us to love in ever larger circles so as to embrace your people everywhere till at last we are all united eternally with you and with all who have gone before us. Amen. Amen. And now, friends, may God bless you and keep you. May God make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up God's countenance upon you and all those you love and grant you peace. Go in that peace to love and serve the Lord. And I invite Brianne to come and introduce our closing song. As my mom would head upstairs to bed. I would yell. Mama, wait for me. And she would turn around, wait, reach out her hand and say, as if I could ever leave you behind. Even though my mom is gone, I know that's still true today. We are going to close with Katie Lang's Alleluia. This was my mom's favorite rendition of this song. Every bit of good in me is you, Mama. I love you, and I'll miss you forever.
Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude the services for Michelle here at the funeral home today. On behalf of her entire family, they thank you all for your presence and support and show them here today. Please continue to keep her family in your thoughts and prayers over the next days and weeks and months to come. At this time, Chris and his family extend an invitation to all of you to join them back at their home at 39 Farmstead Lane here in Suffield for luncheon and continued fellowship. So please join us. Thank you very much.